BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. All right, hello everybody. Today is Friday, another Anything Goes Friday. Welcome to the show. How's everybody doing? Firstly, I would like to give a big thank you to everyone who listened to the newer episodes that came out under the name of Ned's Journal. Episodes are going to be coming out a little bit more frequently here on Black Box Online Radio. In addition to the regularly scheduled lineup, Zodiac Monday, Jack the Ripper Wednesday, and of course, today is the Anything Goes Friday segment. And in this episode, I will be discussing the book Ron's Revenge, which was written by Chris Todd. And not only did I read the book, but I also had the opportunity to discuss this with Chris Todd a while back. And I did a, I did a previous episode on this channel called um, Was O.J. Simpson Innocent? And in that one, I was talking about different theories in the O.J. case. And it's something that's actually called the O.J. Truther Movement. And it was all across the board, a very broad range, a spectrum of different ideas, just evaluating them one by one. But in this episode, I'm going to be focusing on the ideas and the theories that are expressed in the book Ron's Revenge. And I invite you to listen to some of the episodes that I've done about O.J. Simpson in the past. In 2019, I was pulled into the O.J. Truther movement, more or less. And one person wrote into the channel by saying, Hey, Ned, before listening to you, I thought O.J. Simpson was guilty. Now I don't think so. And I was about to just lose it. I was like, no, no, no. I don't think O.J. Simpson was innocent just because I do an episode on someone else's theory. I want to take a very clear stance. Yes, I think that O.J. Simpson was guilty of the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman back in 1994. But after going through an enormous amount of info and listening to people like Stephen Singular, as well as just um, exploring the far-off corners of YouTube, I came to the conclusion in 2019 that... O.J. Simpson was guilty, but he had an accomplice. And even before reading the book Ron's Revenge, which was written by Chris Todd, I was um, actually discussing this with Chris Todd himself and just sharing that finding, and he comes to a very similar conclusion in the book. Now, Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson were murdered by knife, and of course O.J. Simpson went on to be the um, most publicized figure in the true crime world at the time. It was called the trial of the century, the crime of the century. And very famously, O.J. Simpson was found not guilty of the murders in the criminal court. But did O.J. have an accomplice? Were the murders committed by one person or was there a second person involved? And the biggest problem, like the biggest thorn in my side in dealing with some type of O.J. accomplice theory was I wasn't able to determine... What was the role of the accomplice? Was this just a getaway driver? Was this just someone who was helping to destroy evidence? And I'm going to try and express some ideas that I've read in the book Ron's Revenge, which I invite you to read as well. Number one, O.J. Simpson very clearly admitted that there was an accomplice involved, and he discusses this in the Judith Regan interview, which aired on Fox, and the Judith Regan interview is heavily discussed in the book Ron's Revenge by Chris Todd. Number one, O.J. says that the accomplice was named Charlie. He came to his house and he said, you have to go over to Nicole Brown Simpson's house. Something's going down. And they go over there. And 
there is a knife that was in the car because O.J. Simpson said he carried the knife because of protection. It was easier than carrying a gun because the um, laws were different and just there's less trouble with transporting a knife. And Charlie, this person named Charlie, is actually the one who's holding the knife. And then O.J. takes the knife from Charlie. And after the Judith Regan interview, everybody was like, well, who on earth is this Charlie person? And if you watched the TV special that aired on Fox, they said very clearly they thought that he was Charlie, that it was just um, a different side of his personality. And in the book Ron's Revenge, Charlie is even referred to as an alter ego in theoretical terms. Again, both Chris Todd and I think Charlie was a real person, but some people thought that Charlie was an alter ego. That terminology was used in Ron's Revenge. And then they were these discussions online that, okay, well, it sounds like he's referring to Charlie as his dark side, and that made absolutely no sense at all. Charlie's the one holding the knife, and there's even another line about how Charlie says something like, don't go out there, and then other people, I mean, like in other corners of YouTube, they began to say, well, I mean, it's clearly Charlie isn't the dark side. It sounds like maybe he's referring to Charlie as his moral compass or his conscience, and he's trying to um, talk about how someone was trying to dissuade him from getting into a physical confrontation with Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman, but that also did not sit well with me. And I simply thought that Charlie was a real person. He's described as a real person. He's not shared as some type of um, alter ego or moral compass or side of OJ's personality. And there's a very particular detail that Chris Todd zones in on in the book Ron's Revenge that I've thought about countless times. And that is that Ron Goldman put up a very strong struggle. His knuckles were shredded from fighting somebody. Yet O.J. Simpson did not have any major lacerations to his face. His body was also photographed, and it didn't appear that he had any real marks from striking somebody in combat or being struck in combat himself. And Chris Todd went a step further than I did by saying that Ron Goldman was injured, not by fighting O.J. Simpson, but by fighting Charlie. And I really wish that I had a stronger way of um, analyzing that or debunking that or confirming that in some particular way. But all I'm able to do is simply share that that's the idea that was expressed in the book. Now, what happens after the murders? Again, these murders are committed by knife, very bloody, very gruesome. Nicole Brown Simpson is almost beheaded. Then, if I can understand what Chris Todd has shared out, O.J. Simpson would have stripped down to his boxers, even taking off his shoes. He would keep his black socks on, but he's just in his boxer shorts. This is also shared, um, or supported by a witness who claimed that she saw O.J. Simpson driving the white Bronco, wearing... Um, well, I mean, nothing really on his arms. He was sleeveless. Jill Sively says that he was sleeveless and that she could see his bare arms. And the prosecution didn't even like that because they were trying to create this image of how there's this guy acting all thug-like, wearing all black and having black long sleeves. That's the image that they had in their mind. And that contradicted the um, image that the prosecution was trying to portray. But actually, Charlie is in the passenger seat. And Charlie has the bloody clothes and shoes on um, his lap while O.J. is driving. So, um, I mean, the blood evidence, according to the Martin Sheen documentary, actually seemed rather consistent with somebody opening the passenger side door, jumping into the passenger seat, and then hopping into the driver's seat. But that doesn't mean that Charlie couldn't have entered the passenger seat and been holding O.J.'s bloody clothes. Now, here's another point in the book where I hope. I have been able to interpret it correctly, what Chris Todd was trying to say. And that relates to a particular witness named Cato Kalin, someone who was living on O.J. Simpson's property. And there's a statement that was actually written out by Cato Kalin when he's talking about either some type of theory or some type of information that was shared to him that could have been actual, an actual piece of um, a confession. We aren't completely sure. And Cato is saying something to the effect of a third accomplice, not O.J. or not Charlie who was present at the crime scene, but a third accomplice took those bloody clothes and even the shoes, and they, they took them and had them burned. And then like they were just destroyed. 
so then there wouldn't have been any evidence of the crime. And then there's actually a glove that was found and wiped down. The prints were wiped down and then tossed to the side, and that would have later been recovered by the investigators. So that was something that absol made absolutely no sense to me at all. I mean, firstly, from reading the book, I didn't quite grasp is the person who destroyed the clothes. I mean, it sounds like that should be Charlie, right, the accomplice, but based on the context of it, it almost sounded like it was a third accomplice. And again, this is just an interpretation of a statement made by Cato Kalin, shared by Chris Todd, but I found that to have been a little bit confusing. And the next point is that, well, what do we make of this whole thing about how the clothes are burned, the evidence is destroyed, and that the uh, the glove was not destroyed. And um, I might even take it back. I mean, I was assuming that the shoes would have been included in that, but OJ was wearing the famous Bruno Mali shoes, allegedly, at the crime. And then he was photographed in them later on, or he was photographed um, with, uh, I believe the Bruno Mali shoes were located some way, somehow. No, no. I mean, I don't want to get ahead of myself, so I'm not going to mistake that, but there was a Bruno Mali shoe print found at the crime, at crime scene. In the book, Ron's Revenge, there is a discussion on William C. Deere, a true crime writer who heavily promoted the theory that O.J. Simpson was not guilty of the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman. And instead, there was a different suspect that should have been involved named Jason Simpson, O.J.'s oldest son from his first marriage. And he created this whole theory about how Jason Simpson forged his time card, and he went after um, Nicole Brown Simpson because she was supposed to come to the restaurant Jackson's where Jason worked as a chef, and she didn't show up. And originally, he went to confront her, but Jason actually had some mental health issues. He even had a history of attacking women with, uh, with knives. He attacked an ex-girlfriend, holding her down and cutting her hair off with knives. Jason was a chef. He regularly carried his chef's knives, as many chefs do. But as far as this discussion goes. It simply states in the book Ron's Revenge that um, Chris Todd attempted to get in touch with William C. Deere, and he discussed this, and William C. Deere, Bill Deere as he's known, was not very uh, helpful, so to speak. But Chris Todd does point out a very particular inaccuracy in and problem with Bill Deere's theory, and that relates to the blood evidence after the crime took place. Bill Deere stated that it should indicate that O.J. Simpson did not commit the murders because blood was not found on the pedals of the Bronco. How could there be a Bruno Mali shoe print at Bundy where uh, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman had been murdered, but no blood evidence found on the pedal of the Bronco? I mean, like, how would that be possible? And the explanation has already been shared clear as day. Well, O.J. removed his shoes and he was driving wearing only his socks. So, I mean, I think that that is actually a good observation by Chris Todd. Now, some other parts of the book, though, that I have to not exactly nitpick, but e examine and respond to, and that relates to how people have been trying to profit from the O.J. Simpson case. And there are a lot of people that are listed off in the book and talking about how people like Mark Furman a detective, went on to have a writing career and a broadcasting career. He definitely got involved in show business after this, even though he was the star witness who left in disgrace, more or less. However, it doesn't seem like it affected his appearances on television, so to speak. But then other people are called into question about profiting from the case, and they are Kim Goldman, the uh, sister of Ron Goldman, and she did a podcast on the O.J. Simpson story, and Fred Goldman, the uh, father of Ron Goldman, who definitely wanted to go after O.J. Simpson in the civil court and actually obtain the rights to, uh, or the royalties and the funds from the book, If I Did It, the novel that was written by Pablo Fenieves and then shared under the title of O.J. Simpson. I have absolutely no problem with Kim Goldman or Ron Goldman profiting from the story. His son was murdered, her brother was murdered, in an absolutely gruesome and tragic fate. I mean, if they want to give their side of the story, if they want to share their reactions and do something like a podcast, or at the very least, trying to get compensation 
for losing their son or just recognizing that the person whom they believe was guilty was not convicted well they can respond and challenge his attempts to profit from that and those haven't exactly been too successful because as i understand there was that novel that i said if i did it and it's shared as a novel because it was written by pablo fenieves the ghostwriter for oj simpson and it's presented as a hypothetical but in that um in that exact instance oj received eight hundred thousand dollars for his participation in that book project and he got his money long before the book was published and it's not actually oj's money that they would be benefiting from or that they would be receiving they're not really benefiting from it again this is compensation for losing their son slash brother instead this would be coming from the publishing company but and i also understand that oj simpson um used that eight hundred thousand dollars like on bills expenses legal fees and it was it was just absorbed into costs he didn't even benefit amazingly from that particular story either but in the book if i did it and shared in the two to three again interview O.J. presents it as a hypothetical, and portions of the Judith Regan interview are shared in the book Ron's Revenge, quotations from O.J. Simpson where he is talking about how he um, blacked out, actually, at the time of the crimes. He says that he's there with the accomplice named Charlie, and Charlie is holding a knife. O.J. takes the knife from Charlie, and then he actually blacks out and doesn't remember the events of the crime. But then, and he was, and then even in the interview, he says, okay, now this is hypothetical. This is in the hypothetical if I did it purely for legal reasons. And then that's when they get into the car. OJ is in his boxer shorts, and they're driving back from Bundy, where Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman were murdered, to the Rockingham estate where OJ lived. And a big um, instant, instance in the book of just um, theorizing, postulating, hypothesizing, if you will, involves a story of how O.J. Simpson could have gone to McDonald's with Cato Kalin after the murder to try and give himself an alibi. But this was actually asked as a question in the book, and a question that I do not have an answer to. So, did O.J. Simpson and Cato Kalin actually go to a McDonald's that night? And I was like, well, I mean, I don't know. That's the contemporary um, explanation, or that's the um, widely accepted explanation rather than contemporary. But the question that follows that is, or did they go to Burger King, which was a uh, drug spot? Like, did they go to buy drugs? I'm simply not sure. I wish I had a stronger answer to that. And I can comprehend how this is easily going to turn into blending in a type of um, connection to the drug world because if you spend any time in the oj truther movement circles as i did in the past you will see that a lot of people who think that oj was innocent believe that nicole brown simpson and ron goldman were murdered because of drug connections and because of an individual named faye resnick a friend of nicole brown simpson who had drug debts and that Faye uh, was supposed to have been with Nicole Brown Simpson and being targeted. Ron Goldman was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that Faye Resnick actually went to rehab to avoid paying her drug debts. And that just they were killed by multiple um, attackers who were not OJ, were not anyone directly in OJ's circle. But, I mean, another point of the book, Ron's Revenge, that gets a little bit confusing is... This accomplice named Charlie comes to O.J.'s house on the night of, well, before the murder's taking place. And Charlie is a new friend. He had done cocaine with O.J. in the past. And he said that something was going down at Nicole Brown Simpson's. And there's one paragraph that I didn't completely understand where it talks about how it sounds like Charlie is asking for money to pay off Faye Resnick's gambling, it's not gambling debt, Faye Resnick's drug debt, Faye Resnick's drug debt excuse me i don't know why i said the word gambling and i wasn't exactly sure how that was involved i mean anyway um that sounds something that either i misinterpreted or wasn't extremely clear in the book but then oj simpson goes to 
Bundy, where Nicole Brown Simpson lived. And as um, I recall, she would have just been in the bathtub. She lit some candles and she's taking some type of, um, you know, home care relaxation bath. And then Ron Golden came by because he was actually supposed to be returning a pair of glasses to Nicole Brown Simpson. And this is where a lot of, um, again, um, hypothesizing came into play. Everybody was insisting that Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson were involved. I thought it was a widely accepted fact that he was her boyfriend, but in some interviews with Kim Goldman, she stated very clearly that they were just friends, that he was just a very outgoing and friendly person. She was a regular customer at La Mezzaluna, where Ron worked, and that they weren't actually romantically involved, and she left her glasses there, and because they were friends, Ron Goldman is trying to return them, and then he got caught in the wrong place at the wrong time. That part seems to be accurate. And that OJ says that when he's squaring off with Ron Goldman, he, oh, Ron Goldman was a black belt in karate. He took a karate-like stance, and OJ says, what, you think you can kick my ass? And the, there's one explanation that was provided in the Judith Regan interview, and that is that the reason why OJ Simpson was not harmed in the fight was that O.J. outweighed Ron by about 50 pounds, and he was holding a knife. He was able to overpower him. But uh, as I said previously, the explanation that is shared in the book Ron's Revenge is that it was actually Charlie who was involved with the physical altercations. So you have multiple attackers and possibly even multiple knives, a single-edged knife and a double-edged knife. But I don't even think that that is the... Um, most important detail. I mean, that that is discussed a little bit in the book, but the most important detail, I think, is that there's this other individual who did not go to trial, Charlie, and um, to the credit of Chris Todd, he does claim that he can identify who Charlie is, but then they get into this physical uh, fight. Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson are left dead. O.J. Simpson strips down. He's driving back to Rockingham, and he's getting ready for a flight to Chicago. And very simply, um, the rest is history. I mean, whatever happened after that is so difficult to pinpoint. And was Cato Kalin a bigger accomplice, or was he just someone who was living on the property and wasn't um, paying too much attention? He heard some thumps near an air conditioner. And again, was he just somebody who happened to be living in a guest house at the absolute wrong place to live in a guest house? Those questions seem to be quite difficult to explore, but I th it's always bothered me about how one person completely got away with the Brown Simpson Goldman murders. And very early on, I began to also try and find clues that would point in the direction of an accomplice in the O.J. Simpson case. And what do you think, though? Do you believe that O.J. was the single perpetrator? Do you believe that O.J. Simpson was guilty, as I've stated, and as Chris Todd stated, but he also had an accomplice, and there was another person involved? And on that note, I have to share something with you guys that is a little bit difficult to um, talk about, because, I mean, I don't know this as, as a fact, but... If you watch American Crime Story, there's a very big recreation of Robert Kardashian, yes, the Kardashian clan patriarch. Robert Kardashian is a lawyer, but he's no longer practicing law, and they decide to reactivate his law license, his legal license. And just from reading up on the case in the past, it has been discussed that the reason why Robert Kardashian's legal license was activated and he became counsel for O.J. Simpson was because they didn't want him to testify about the contents of a bag that O.J. Simpson had, O.J. Simpson's garment bag, and that there's actually a recreation of that in American Crime Story, The People vs. O.J. Simpson, where Robert Kardashian goes through the garment bag and he doesn't find anything, like he doesn't find any bloody clothes. And based on the theory that's shared in um, Chris Todd's book, well, the bloody clothes would have been destroyed by an accomplice after the murder, so he would definitely not find them. But, I mean, well, then what on earth is with that line about Robert Kardashian examining the garment bag and he has to reactivate his legal license and become legal counsel so he doesn't have to testify about it? Well, I mean, if that's... Like, what is that? What is that? Is that just a mistake that has been shared in the media, or is that just, um, well, O.J. had bloody clothes in there and Robert Kardashian covered for him. I'm seeing almost a split here, an inconsistency 
in people's stories. But then the final option would be, do you, do you believe that O.J. Simpson was innocent and that there was a different assailant? Do you believe it was Jason Simpson? I absolutely do not think Jason Simpson committed the murders. Do you believe that this was a drug-related or a gang-related connection, particularly drug-related as um, associated with the uh, drug debts of Faye Resnick or possibly the drug connections at La Mezzaluna, where Nicole Brown Simpson would frequent? Do you believe that there was just a different killer or killers altogether? You can put your ideas in the comment section down below, but if you're going to propose an alternative theory, I would like you to just explain your reasons why. Like, if you think it was Jason Simpson, please explain your reasons why. Or if you think it was a drug-related murder, you can share your reasons why in the comment section down below. If you think that it was just, um, just the conventional narrative that O.J. Simpson did this by himself, also, please state your reasons, and I would invite you to read the book Ron's Revenge by Chris Todd, and some of the um, introductory material that he shares is that he spent um, quite a while researching the book. He read over 5,000 uh, pages of transcripts, also got in touch with Marsha Clark and Chris Darden from the prosecution team, as talking, well as talking to other uh, true crime writers on the case, particularly William C. Deere. And just trying to get everybody's side of the story. And I believe he also got in touch with Cato Kalin as well. So, one more time, the book is called Ron's Revenge by Chris Todd, and it explores a theory involving O.J. Simpson's accomplice in perhaps the world's most famous double murder. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always blackboxned88 over on Instagram. And I will see you there for the bonus podcast. Until next time.